Hi everyone, welcome to Token Topics. XDC Network's the topic of this video. We're gonna get a better understanding of different agencies helping the XDC Network to grow and be used, such as IDFA. We're gonna hear from a financial expert from IDFA and Impel on trade finance and the future of blockchain. We're also gonna go over some recent news from Go Plugin, so you don't wanna miss this video. Please hit the like, share, and subscribe if you do enjoy the content. And remember, I'm not sponsored or affiliated by Zinfin or the XDC Network. And remember, any investing is risky. Do it at your own risk. With that out of the way, let's dive in. Go Plugin, XDC's decentralized oracle, just raises security bar with the introduction of the verifiable random function or VRF. So this feature brings a new level of integrity to decentralized applications generating and verifying random numbers in an unprecedented way. They state to please stay tuned, so we're going to keep our eyes on this. The future is bright for XDC. All the groundwork is being laid. And you had an important event a few days ago, IDFA and DNI Initiative Day. This is important for the future of trade finance. And the gentleman all the way pictured to the right standing up is Andre Kassman of Kassman Advisory. He's also a board member of IDFA. He's part of the DNI Initiative, part of Trade Tech. He's very much involved with the XCC ecosystem and helping to implement this technology. Now, these events are crucial for the groundwork being laid. States here, Andre Kasserman at Kasserman Advisory and ITFA board member delivered a technology keynote on leveraging distributive ledger technology in trade finance, the world of Web3 and digital assets role in trade. Kasserman presented the blueprint for digital negotiable instruments, emphasizing the need to align policy with technological advancements, focus on interoperability, add new value to digital flows, promote open platforms and ecosystems, and expand supply chain finance. For the path forward, ITFA is contributing significantly to this evolution, and with legal changes happening quickly and attracting a lot of interest, the future of trade finance is bright. The tokenization of infrastructure for a sustainable future. The XCC network is perfect for these applications. So This is posted by Circularity Finance. Tokenization of infrastructure, a blockchain-based solution to financing sustainable infrastructure. So you can see it was tagged here. We are XDC, XDC network, built on XDC. And there's a lot of people from the XDC network or involved with the XDC network that's highlighted here. So the, the main value proposition of tokenizing sustainable infrastructure lies in its potential to decrease the cost of financing. Ton tokenization can also deliver a wide range of financial and operational benefits. Tokenization can deliver a wide range of benefits such as lower transaction costs, better transparency, enhanced liquidity, access to alternative sources of capital, decentralization, and increased efficiency while addressing the issue of scale. Is that not the XDC network? Perfect. Tokenization or tokenizing real assets is still in its early stages. However, as the case study in this paper demonstrates, there are already several initiatives gaining considerable traction. There are, of course, challenges, both regulatory and related to technology, that need to be overcome in order to have a wider adoption. Now, let's go over some of these initiatives, and then we're going to hear an expert from ITFA. So, what are some of these organizations supporting the trade finance industry? The International Trade and Forfeiting Association, or IDFA, was founded in 1999 as a world trade association for companies, financial institutions, and intermediaries engaged in global trade. Forfeiting supply chain and receivables financing, its members work together to originate and distribute trade-related risk. The XDC network was invited to become first and at the time of writing, the only layer one blockchain ecosystem member. Next, we have the Digital Negotiable Instruments or DNI Initiative. Uh, XDC Network joined the DNI Initiative in November of 2021 and provides the needed blockchain structure and interoperability for financial institutions to communicate across various platforms and ecosystems. So I just want to stop right there. So, are you seeing these initiatives are helping to implement? and allow for this technology to be used. It continues, the association was formed by the IDFA and it aims to fully digitize trade documents 
and negotiable instruments as well as integrate them into existing processes. Then we have the Trade Finance Distribution Initiative or TFDI, a consortium of the world's leading banks and non-bank financial institutions established by the ITFA for purpose of liquefying trade finance. XDC Network was selected in 2021 as a first, at the time of writing, the only blockchain ecosystem member. This gives me an indication that XDC Network is here to stay and it's going to be mainstream adopted. Now we're going to listen to Sarah Mikhail. She is a committee member of IDFA. She's also a global business development manager for Impel, which is built on the XDC network. She is an expert in trade finance and she's going to share her knowledge. In fact, I started with, uh, I was a double degree student, journalism and finance. Uh, journalism, is, journalism is because I always like to, you know, uh, I was, I'm a very inquisitive person. Uh, but I always wanted a subject matter. You know, I thought that there was something that I needed to learn. And then in 2008, the subprime mortgage crisis happened that had a ripple effect all around the world. Um, and that's when I was like, OK, I don't understand what the credit crunch is or why it's happening. I was in my sophomore year at the time. And then I was like, you know what, I'm going to do a double degree and I'm also going to you know, major in finance as well. So I graduated with a double degree from the American University in Cairo. And then I started my first job as a financial journalist, which made sense uh, uh, with Thomson Reuters. I was based in Egypt as well. And then little did I know, I got a little more than I bargained for. The Arab Spring happened in 2011. So we were very understaffed for the kind of news that was there because, you know, nothing earth shattering used to happen that much in that part of the world. Um, so no matter what your subject matter was as a journalist, you had to be fielded on the grounds to cover what was going on. Um, as a patriot, I loved what I did, but I've obviously after that, I didn't want to continue doing uh, political journalism uh, so much more than financial journalism. And then that's when I realized, you know what, through my writing, I discovered that I had a huge interest in transaction banking and how corporates manage their working capital and their and their you know their funding and their projects and whatnot and that took me into into banking so i started with citibank and then into deutsche bank and then a texas all within the realm of of transaction banking but predominantly i would also say trade not just cash management and um while i was you know while while i'm in the field from a traditional standpoint that's when I started to dabble a little bit with Web3 and try and understand, OK, what is this blockchain? It was as basic as not even knowing what was the difference between crypto and blockchain, you know, or and then, you know, I started uh, dipping my toes, if you will, with the lease investment going through these free MOOCs online. Um, and uh, then I got more and more interested and I was like, OK, this this technology makes sense. Yes, I see a lot of these reflecting on my day to day. I see a lot of these operational inefficiencies and these emails that go back and forth for certain aspects when you do trade and whatnot, trade finance. And then I was like, oh, this will this may very well be the future. And that's when I started to invest even more. So I started to take executive education with MIT and Wharton to know more about fintechs, to know more about smart contracts, um, DLT, blockchain. And then after that, when I got so interested and so sucked into the field, I actually uh, uh, decided to pursue a master's degree in blockchain and crypto. And I was one of uh, 20 recipients of the scholarship grant awarded by Binance Academy. I think I'd like to hit on the, the trade part of things. So you went from journalism to now getting into trade. Can you talk about that a little bit? What was your interest in trade yeah. and in, in trade finance? And what was it that you were doing once you got into it? Sure. I mean, when it comes to trade finance, essentially, you are financing the real economy because it's all about the exports and the imports uh, that happen between uh, corporations. Uh, so there's an element of risk management where you're talking about instruments like letter of credit. There is there is an element of supporting uh, small to medium enterprises by them not being the client, but you're taking the buyer risk, say, of a multinational corporate or a large corporate where you're comfortable with the risk. And then they owe payments to these uh, small, medium uh, enterprise suppliers. And instead of them, you know, getting loans, the suppliers, expensive loans to try to get the next sourcing of supplies, 
through the risk of the good credit buyer, you're able to procure early re repayment to these suppliers. And then therefore their working capital is able to go forward without having, having to wait for payment terms, say that wait till 90 days, you're able to pay them back, say 60 days or 30 days. And with SMEs, it's very uh, time critical and sensitive for them. At the same time, what's in it for the, for the buyer uh, is that sometimes you can make these liabilities depending on their uh, accountancy treatment off balance sheet, which helps reduce the, the overall treatment of liabilities on, on the balance sheet and obviously making their suppliers happy. So, so it's a win-win situation and also for the financial world as well. So I'll say a triple win situation um, with such financing. So that's what, that's what interested me the most with this field. And to me, it seems blockchain and, and Web3 is such a good fit for, for trade and trade finance. So what do you think is holding it back from progressing more into that technology? I think it's all that you just mentioned, but I'd like to circle back first and foremost, awareness and education. And I was happy that you brought that up as the first thing, you know, to, to kickstart this session, because in fact, when I was in a round table with one of the local regulators and they were talking about how can we help regulation around Web3, you know, they here in the UAE, they're very conducive in uh, trying to bring regulations that help um, with the, you know, knowing that it's not one size fits all with the traditional laws and, and, and Web3 laws. And the first thing we picked out and we said that we want to do a workshop on is awareness and education. That's, I think, the major roadblock out there. Um, but, the, but yes, beyond that, there are other, there are other areas as well. Uh, I would say uh, it is an exciting time where we are right now in trade finance and that intersection with I would say electronic in general. I wouldn't just say blockchain. Um, you might have heard of Militer, which is the model law of electronic uh, transfer records and uh, the electronic uh, bill in the UK. So it's actually uh, being looked at by Parliament right now. And the latest from the ICC UK, I believe last week, they said that it, we should expect this being ratified in law uh, very soon in a matter of days. And what's, what's important about this when we talk about the UK is that, if I'm not mistaken, 80% of commercial trade laws are under UK law or English court system law. So don't look at this as just something that's just going to affect the UK. No, it's going to affect every commercial trade uh, uh, agreement that is governed under UK law. And there's, there's, there's you know, a huge backing for that in international markets. And what this does essentially, and what what this whole discussion is about, is the trade the trade industry, uh, believe it or not, had a lot of laws, especially when it came to shipping documents, that were modeled after laws from the 1800s. Yes, you heard this correctly, from the 1800s. Wow. And only now, yes, yeah, so that's why everything was a huge paper trail. The shipping documents, the commercial documents, the contracts with the banks or the financiers, insurance. You can imagine the whole ecosystem from origination all the way to, to trade asset distribution to the shipping documents in between, everything. And because of that, when it comes to risk mitigation, so for instance, as a bank, I do finance, but I need to know that there is a bill of lading that I can hold as custody in case a repayment doesn't happen. Or for instance, um, uh, the LC terms, for instance, or or whatever whatever document that comes in in, in, in paper form. The issue with that is that if you were to go to a court of law, if this was in electronic format, it wouldn't have had an equal footing or standing as it would in paper. So no matter what technology you had out there, if the law didn't help what they call a possession of the asset, if the possession was not there. And then what tells you that this is the, um, you know, because there's also that discussion in the digital age. If I have a PDF and that PDF went to the hands of a wrong party at the wrong time, uh, is that the original copy or not? Can they ask for repayment instead of somebody else or not, or, you know, do something fraudulent, yes or no? So I think one of the main important aspects is to tailor regulation that not only gives equal footing, but talks about how uh, presentation, for instance, of LCs are done. And this you would see with the International Chamber of Commerce. They have issued supplementary trade finance, um, uh, I would say, practices, like for instance, instead of just UCP 600, which governs LCs, uh, it's EUCP. And actually there's a second version that just came out end of, end of June this year. 
So I think the industry, whether it's the International Chamber of Commerce, whether it's regulation by law, and oh yes, uh, beginning of the quarter of this year, the shipping uh, industry, the Digital Shipping uh, Association said that by 2025, 50% of bill, bills of lading are going to be issued electronically. So you're talking about your Maersk, your Hapag Lloyd, your CMA, CGM, all these big uh, shipping companies. And by 2030, they pledge that they're going to go 100%. And that, I think 2023 is a game changer for trade and I would say electronic trade in general or trade tech in general, irrespective of what medium of, of tech you use, because this is where all the parties of the ecosystem are coming together. Shipping, regulation, bank and the ICC. That's important. And that's going to pave the way forward. I think that's why if you look at certain names in trade tech that didn't make it, a lot of it was because of these areas have not you know, reached to the maturity that they've reached in 2023. But I would say more importantly, even had they lived, unfortunately, a lot of them were made in consortium of banks with their own separate digital islands where probably one or two banks in that consortium led and the others probably felt a bit left out. So I think generally... What should happen is, if you're considering blockchain in particular, is to go with a public blockchain and a bridge for the information that needs to be private with a private DLT. That, I would believe, in my personal opinion, the ideal way to go and that that blockchain is supported by industry bodies, say, like the ICC, you know, not a particular bank, because then that becomes a bit, you know... Uh, Makes it more difficult. I more would difficult. say learning, learning, learning from, yeah, learning from the past and what happened with trade tech in general. But yes, in terms of the ecosystem, I think now it's very uh, helpful to take things forward for the industry. In mm -hmm. trade, there's so many different variables that are involved and so mm -hmm. many different industries that are involved to make one single thing work. So getting all of those different industries and all of those different players to work the same way and communicate the same way and evolve and adopt technology in the same way is difficult. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's what holds it back from moving along. Because even like the the bill that you're talking about, MLETR, the, yeah. the bill and, and yeah. uh, electronic trade documents, that still doesn't make it necessarily law. It just makes it now an acceptable form, right? So it doesn't mean that people have to necessarily adopt it. It just means that it's an option now, basically. Yep. And I believe we, we talked about this uh, a couple episodes ago, uh, right, Dave, where we were talking about how it's not necessarily making it mandatory, because if, if you made it mandatory where everybody had to be electronic, trade would shut down overnight because mm -hmm. so many people just aren't doing it. Um, yeah, they need to reskill. Yeah. Moving forward. Sure. So, but I like where you said that a lot of them, a lot of stuff in trade is around the UK law. So this law passing and these guidelines being set, it should at least help everybody understand what the expectations are and what you can do and create a roadmap for people to actually start adopting this technology. Information, education, what would you say the biggest misconception is for, for the users, um, uh, potential users of, of blockchain technology? I think it was like mine. Oh, crypto is blockchain. Blockchain is crypto. Uh, crypto uh, is, is uh, you know, volatile, uh, the, you know, the start of all evil. I think <laughs> the way some people, the way some people look at it because they, they you know, they think, oh, okay, uh, uh, there's going to be uh, issues with money laundering. There's going to be issues because you don't know the identity uh, of things going around where they shouldn't. So I think this is the major misconception. There, there, um, not a lot of people believe it or not even heard of stable coins, for instance, as an alternative, as one of the digital assets or cryptos out there, um, or or some other forms of uses of crypto that you know that you can peg to a certain asset, for instance, or whatnot, where you can say, okay, there's some form of stability here. Um, so I think I think what will help change, and let's talk about upskill, reskilling being, as I said, the major barrier, I believe, because you know, to the point that Lance made, absolutely, the option is there, but do you use it as a different thing? I think when people start to see what are the, what how, what's in it for me, and I think what's going to push the what's in it for me is when they see what's in it for their clients and corporate clients, especially are starting to see what's in it for them and banks also. Um, 
first of all, is that you don't need an army of operations team that look and, you know, validate, for instance, LCs. LCs are one of the instruments that have one of the highest rejection rates because of discrepancies between what the buyer says and what the seller says. And it's it's very pricey. And that's why it doesn't make it to the SME segment, because it's a very pricey instrument. Um for instance, uh, now banks are hungry for for uh, sustainable trade finance transactions, so things that go with ESG. So are corporates. Corporates want to make their headlines that you know they're practicing ESG, um, you know, not just in their operations but also in the financing that they do. So when you have blockchain that is able through probably through oracles, able to verify information that a certain batch, say like let's say cotton, has been sourced in an ESG manner, and then there is a buyer that forms the, the, the shirts themselves from the cotton supply, and then you see all the chain being ESG friendly, then even they can create platforms, for instance, for different financiers, banks and neobanks and, and even non-banks to, to, to finance these kind of sustainable trades, because a lot of financiers want to say, hey, I have a budget of, or of, of money to deploy in that segment. And, and where can I find it? So blockchain is going to help a lot with that. Um, like I talked about the uh, whole operational aspect that you don't need to verify. There are not a lot, a lot of intermediaries. So when you reduce the costs that are involved in procuring trade finance uh, from a financing element, you become more inclusive to the SME segment. Uh, and that's the, you know, the infamous, uh, I think in every conference we hear that number, and I think that number gets larger by the year, is the $1.7 trillion trade finance gap. That gap has to be bridged, and I believe blockchain is one of the ways ways to bridge it. SMEs, for instance, have a high rejection rate when it comes to financing. It could go um, 20% up to 50% of rejection rates, depending where you are in the world. Uh, could even go beyond that. And it's understandable because banks find them as a high risk uh, segment. They have a lack of, of, of collateral, not sufficient records when it comes to fin um, you know, financial reporting, uh, credentials, etc. And through blockchain, if you're able to trace what they do, how they've behaved, um, uh, you know, in terms of, of repaying uh, 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 towards towards a financing or whatnot then you're able to build even credentials for SMEs or you can create pools um, of financing towards SMEs. Like one of the areas that is interesting, it's actually built on XDC is, 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 is trade tech. And the idea of that is that a lot of the banks, so just not just the origination side, but the trade asset risk distribution side is banks when they take um, a, 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 you know quote unquote risky deal, they want to de-risk a little bit of it. So they send it, for instance, to either participating on risk with another bank or with an insurance company. Now, the thing is, whether it's the bank, the insurance company, the third party bank, they also have limits that are capped towards certain countries, certain industries, a particular um, uh, corporate. So when you run out of that, what happens? Do you refuse the deal and then widen the gap of that 1.7 trillion? So now with trade tech, you're, you're now pooling these assets or invoices and making it an asset class worthy of investment for people like you and me. You can invest in a multi-million invoice that needs to be, say, discounted as an investor for something as little as, say, 100 bucks. So yeah. you're actually, you know, talking about the real economy, you're investing in the real economy. There, there are a lot of use cases with blockchain and trade finance. So, so often when we talk about the trade finance gap, the uh, SMEs, they almost seem like a sector, but just wanted to put it in context a little bit. They are the majority of business. Is that the SME? 90%. Like the vast majority, 90%, yes. exactly. Yes. Yeah, so th th this, th this, there's a lot of people who are affected. It's not a, a sector of businesses. Yeah. Decent is celebrating Ripple's victory against the SEC by giving away XRP, 24,000 XRP, will be given away to those who purchase a decent biometric wallet. So to celebrate the win of Ripple against the SEC, we are hosting an XRP giveaway event. For each decent biometric wallet unit purchase, you will receive 30 XRP. The offer stands for the first 800 units, so you don't wanna wait. And it's extremely simple. All you do is purchase a decent biometric wallet through my affiliate links in the description below, you're not only going to receive $30 off the retail price, 
but you're also going to receive your XRP as long as you fill out your form. So all you do is purchase a wallet. Then after you receive your wallet in the mail, then you simply fill out your form and submit it. If, make sure you fill out the form before August 6th and you will receive your 30 XRP August 9th. This is the giveaway form. I'm going to put this in the description next to the purchasing links. Now I have important information to go over before you submit it. Token Topics is an affiliate of Decent Wallet. So my purchasing links are directly from the store. So this section right here where it says purchase channel, make sure you highlight decent official website. Also, if you purchase two wallets, you get 60 XRP. If you do decide to purchase two wallets, make sure you highlight that. Also, we will send your XRP to one address. Well, everyone, that's all I have for the video. I hope you did enjoy the content. Please share to get the word out about the XDC network. Believe it or not, average people like you and I can make a difference in helping this ecosystem grow. Again, thanks for watching and take care.